Sarah, um, can I pass over to uh, Professor John Hanley, who will formally introduce Sarah. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, it's a great privilege to introduce this evening's talk by Professor Sarah Bridal in the lecture series for Wilmslow's Festival of Nature to coincide with COP26, the United Nations Conference of the Parties. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Stuart Kinsey and the Wilmslow Civic Trust for partnering with Transition Wilmslow on this influential lecture series and Stuart for his wonderful chairmanship, a series which has exceeded all expectations in attracting a large and varied audience. Our topic this evening could hardly be more significant, the influence of food choices on climate change. During COP26, we've learned that the next 20 years, perhaps even this current decade, are critical for avoiding the most damaging impacts of climate change. Methane in particular, which is a relatively short-lived greenhouse gas, has emerged as a key target for early action to combat climate change. For many of us, our introduction to Sarah was a memorable annual Transition Wilmslow lecture three years ago on November 21st, 2018. Perhaps we should be thankful that we are online this evening because Pippa Tyrell's note of a full house meeting at the Wilmslow Guild refers to plenty of people being brave enough to try freeze dried mealworms and bush crickets. Uh, Sarah uh, has continued her association with Transition Wilmslow and inspired a surge of interest in food growing and the transformation of our food group into the community market garden group. We now have four community gardens, including a major new initiative at Oakenclough on Colshaw Farm. Back in 2018, Sarah, who describes herself as a transdisciplinary researcher, was embarking on her own transition from a distinguished professor of astrophysics in the Extra Galactic Astronomy and Cosmology Research Group at the University of Manchester to apply her cosmological skills at handling big data sets to exploring data sets around food choices and their impact on climate change. Sarah will herself explain uh, what brought about that remarkable transition for which we and planet Earth are both grateful. Part of the inspiration was Professor David Mackay, a former colleague of hers in the Department of Physics at Cambridge University, who in 2009 published a remarkable book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Um, in 2020, Sarah published her own sequel to that titled Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air, with the subtitle Change your diet, the easiest way to help save the planet. And that is the title of Sarah's talk this evening. Over to you, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, John. And um, it's really been a, a great pleasure to be um, talking with all of you um, as part of Transition Wilmslow and um, particularly um, I, I, I will never forget the, um, the uh, second uh, annual lecture of the Transition Wilmslow because I remember talking to, uh, to Anthony uh, Jones about it at a time when I was really unsure myself of what I was doing. And uh, Anthony must have believed in me that I was doing something worthwhile enough that, uh, that it was worth having this, uh, this talk. And so it's sort of taken off since then. 
Um, so yeah, good to see you there and to uh, see all of you who I've got to know over the, the following uh, three years. I was shocked when you said it was three years because it feels like, uh, in a way it feels like longer, in a way it feels like uh, no time at all. But, um, but yes, to get to know many of you in, in, in Wilmslow and to be part of um, this fantastic uh, food group, which um, was, you know, coming out of many, many years of hard work by many of you, including Gary um, in, on this call, I can see over there. So, um, you know, it's brilliant to be part of this project um, that's come out of, the, of lockdown um, as we talk more about, about the food system and out of the, the huge foundation that Transition Wilmslow brings. And also, I, I would like to thank you all because um, some of you might remember pre-lockdown in uh, January uh, 2020, uh, in, a, in a church hall and uh, <laughs> uh, I was practicing on you guys for my TEDx talk which um, you gave me lots of valuable feedback on lots and lots and lots of post-it notes which made a huge difference uh, and uh, ended up rewriting that talk and uh, that was um, uh, you know been a big deal for me um, getting that TEDx talk done and, um, and lots of people have, have given feedback since so yeah, it's really, really sort of feels very um, uh, sort of fitting to be coming full circle and talk to you this evening. So I'm just going to share my screen. But before I do that, I just want to give a sort of note about the format, because in all honesty, I've given this talk a few times now. And what I enjoy most about it is answering questions rather than giving my slides, because I already kind of know what I'm going to say. So what's interesting to me is what your questions are and uh, what you think about it all and you know the reason why I do talks like this is partly because it's fun but also partly because in order to actually change the food system uh, and therefore reduce its impact on climate change we need um, a dialogue of citizens uh, and you know I, I know it's a very uh, special group of citizens that will come on a Wednesday evening uh, to a talk like this but you know, between us, we need to help to create this trans transition and massive system, systemic change and behaviour change, um, which is about changing what we eat and how we decide what to eat and how that works across the country and, and globally. And so, you know, how do we make that change? That's something that I don't know, and I can never know sitting in a university and uh, reading research papers. It's actually from talking to people who buy and eat food um, that we can figure this out together. So this is really kind of a starting point for discussion more than, you know, I've got to get through this particular number of slides, for example. So I'm just going to hopefully share my screen, although it's now not offering me that option. Hold on. Uh, share screen. Am I already sharing this? Maybe I'm already sharing. Am I already sharing something? No, okay, that's unfortunate. Okay, so I'm not already sharing my slides. Okay, sorry, there'll be a short pause while I try to work out why it's not giving me that option. Share screen. Okay, I'm gonna just restart the PowerPoint thing. We did test this earlier and it did work. It worked, it worked it, earlier, didn't it? It did work earlier, yeah. It says I'm the host now, which suggests that something... Well, well you should be able to do... I made you host to see if that helps join. Yeah, no, I'm not sure it does. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to save that, reopen it, and then hope for the best. An error occurred while saving. Oh, great. <laughs> That's slightly worrying. Okay, fine, whatever. I'll just... Kill that window and reopen it. Okay. Let's try this again. Share screen. It has been it has been set up that everyone can share screen. Yeah, no, it's for some reason it's giving me lots of options except for sharing this particular window of my screen. So what I'm going to have to do, which is not what I wanted to do, I'm going to have to share this, the whole screen and then I'm going to not be able to see your questions on the chat properly. Um, so I'm just going to have to um, dip in and out and ask you to help me with that. So I'll, share I'll keep an eye on it too, sir. Right. Thank you very much. Brilliant. OK, so it's actually, can you see, can you see that? Because I can see the chat still on the side. Can you see the whole slide? Yeah, that's so brilliant. I shall. Yes, I shall it's coming through now. <laughs> okay, thanks, Larson. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how different foods contribute to climate change. 
I don't need to convince any of you on this call, I'm sure, about the existence of climate change. Um, but this um, graphic actually was made by um, a former colleague of mine in astrophysics um, after he uh, transitioned from astrophysics into uh, being at now a, a leading climate scientist. And um, I see this all over the place now. We were looking at this in the, in the transition Wilmslow lecture three years ago, but this was even on masks at the COP, uh, at the COP summit. I saw uh, some of these masks made with this picture on. And so this is showing a different colour every year uh, since 19, uh, sorry, 1850, showing the average temperature. And I saw even saw a uh, knitted version of this at the uh, Women's Institute stand at the, um, the Oak and Clef Market Garden uh, open day a couple of weeks ago as part of the Festival of Nature. Um, and so I don't need to tell you that um, the amount of carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere and really increasing rapidly since the Industrial Revolution and driving this whole thing. But what a lot of people don't know is the contribution of food to climate change. And I actually showed this slide um, three years ago and that this actually changed since. So since uh, three years ago, the latest estimates are showing that actually one third of all climate change, so an increase on the one quarter that the best estimates gave um, three years ago, um, and that's actually gone up to one third, partly because of slightly improved data, but also partly because we're actually eating more greenhouse gas emissions intensive foods and there are more people. And this is going to keep increasing as a fraction of the contribution to climate change. And particularly if we stop burning fossil fuels, uh, then this part is going to disappear and we're going to be left with uh, most of this is going to disappear and we're going to be left with food being the dominant contribution to climate change. And in fact, if even if we stop burning fossil fuels right now and we get rid of all of this, food alone is projected to use up the whole carbon budget for two degrees of rise by the end of the century if we do nothing about it. So we absolutely have to change at what we're eating. And if we don't, then climate change is going to do that for us. And certainly, if we don't stop burning the fossil fuels, we are going to be changing what we're eating, whether we like it or not. And this um, contribution in red is coming from all across um, cutting down forests, uh, mostly rainforests to clear land for agriculture. This includes uh, fertilizers on the fields, it includes burps and uh, manure from animals, uh, processing, packaging, transportation, cooking and food waste all add up to produce this one third of all climate change coming from food. So it's an incredibly important part of the story. And it's actually, um, it's a really fun topic, food, I think, um, it's something that uh, we all think about, um, uh, maybe um, more than a lot of other the uses of, of fossil fuels, for example, maybe a bit more subconscious. Um, if you're interested in details, then here's a, a nice graphic showing the breakdown of food causing about a quarter of climate change as it was then um, compared to other things like um, driving, um, heating um, and construction. So you can see that if we add all of the different contributions uh, up from the whole food sector, then this is actually larger than those other things. And that includes livestock and crops and this cutting down uh, forests uh, for agriculture. And there's been many, many reports now, and this, this topic of food and climate change has uh, really taken off over the last year or two. Um, and this is, you know, there's a lot now about dietary change. So not just changing how we produce food, but also basically all the research is now showing that we, we do need to reduce food waste. We do need to change and increase our efficiency um, of how we produce food and change our farming practices to reduce their impact on climate change. But those things alone are not going to be sufficient. We actually also have to change our diets. And of those different things, dietary change has the much bigger potential to help reduce the impact of food on climate change, but very difficult to do. Many reports on how we might do that. Now, as, uh, as John said earlier, I was very much uh, inspired in my approach to this by um, David Mackay, who wrote this fantastic book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, it had a huge influence on me as, a, as an undergraduate in Cambridge, 
um, a fantastic mentor really changed um, my way of thinking. And um, this was really the inspiration to me to, to try to sort of, um, I guess, you know, deal with his um, terminal illness, which was diagnosed in about 2015. And, and yeah, and this was really, you know, sort of my kind of self therapy to, to deal with that was really trying to put my energies into something towards um, the, the, the work that he was do, had been doing. And the way that David would approach this kind of uh, problem in his book was really to get very quantitative and to illustrate things with these kind of bar charts and to, to compare things uh, as, as, as closely as possible on a sort of personal level. So looking at the um, amount of um, greenhouse gas emissions from food per person per day. And that comes out to be about six kilograms. Now I could probably lift six kilograms if I had to pick up a rucksack containing six bags of sugar, for example, I could probably lift that, but it's quite, heavy. It's quite a lot uh, if you think about it that way. And um, actually, if you were to, to get carbon dioxide gas and fill uh, party balloons with six kilograms of carbon dioxide gas, that would actually fill about 200 party balloons. And that's how much, effectively, how much carbon dioxide we're all effectively putting into the atmosphere per person per day because of producing and consuming the food that we that we have. But you know, again, those numbers don't really mean very much unless we put them in some sort of context. And so here I've compared them with driving a car. And so actually, if we were to drive a car. Um, on a 40 kilometer round trip, so that's 12 miles, some, somewhere 12 miles away and back, then we would cause about the same amount of climate change. So on the one hand, this is a big number. On the other hand, if we're routinely driving um, more than 12 miles, then you know, it's, it, that's something we also need to think about and not just thinking about our food consumption and becoming, it's possible to become quite obsessive about food. Um, and actually forget about these other things. And certainly when I first heard about the impacts of food on climate change, I, I went vegan uh, for a year and I, um, I'm pretty sure I stood next to the oven containing my, uh, my jacket potato, um, feeling very smug. I probably popped to the shops to buy some green beans to have with my special vegan uh, jacket potato and beans. And I was probably also unpacking my suitcase for me transatlantic flight and not really having any understanding of how these different contributions to climate change would compare. And so if we think about a transatlantic flight now, then if we were to take one transatlantic flight per year um, and share out the emissions from that flight over 365 days, they would come out to be a bit bigger than our food emissions. So it, in those days when I was taking a lot of transatlantic flights uh, and I now need to sort of make up for it, I think the rest of my life in terms of everything else I'm doing. But um, this is, uh, you know, this is actually the place to start for some people, although we can hopefully feel fairly smug um, after a bit of lockdown um, that we're, we're maybe reducing this somewhat. So just focusing in on the food emissions, um, we are told that we need to, um, oh, my internet connection is unstable on my back, on my back, yes. Okay, great. So we're told we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, um, but how much? Well, we kind of benchmark by 2030, um, then the international agreements say that we need to halve our greenhouse gas emissions. So we're gonna set a daily budget of about um, 3000 grams, so three kilograms per person per day here in gray on the right hand side. And I'm gonna show you some examples now of how different things compare to that daily budget. But I'd like this to be interactive. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Now I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try a, a, a chat question here now actually. So, um, how much now? I'm not no prizes for guessing which causes the most climate change out of a steak and chips, an eight ounce steak and chips, or a jacket potato and beans. But how different do you think those two things are? So I'm looking for a number, you know, is, is it is it like 20% bigger to have the steak compared to the beans and potato, or maybe twice as big, 10 times as big? Um, so I want a number in the chat. 
um, if you can have a guess, or if you've got any questions about this, then um, I'd also, uh, it's really to provoke your questions that I'm uh, asking this. We've got some, uh, some questions, some coming in already. Fantastic, that's great to see. And any guesses, any, keep them coming in, I'm just gonna have a sip. Excellent. So we've got kind of five, 15, 20, 10, five, 10, five, excluding flatulation. Right, well, we need to talk about that. That's good, yeah. So the, Greek, the beans might not be grown in the UK. This is why I like doing it in the chat because we get these extra comments about how you're thinking about it as well. 20 times, very good, very good. Uh, yeah, so we've got a couple of, couple of points there coming out of that. So yeah, so I'm assuming that we're, we're up we're including um, burps um, by the cows, um, but there is this question of human farts as well, which um, strangely doesn't often come up on a Zoom. It used to come up a lot doing in-person talks, but for some reason, everyone apart from Beverly has been very discreet uh, so far in, in, the, in the Zoom talks. So we probably should talk about that. Now I did research this actually, um, and the, I read some uh, interesting papers where they had, had people sitting on a chair with a special tube. Anyway, we don't need to talk in detail how they measured this, but basically they found out that actually increasing the amount of beans does uh, change the amount of flatulation, but it does not increase the amount of greenhouse gases. Um, so there's some, some sort of relief there at least. So, um, yeah, so we don't need to worry about that fortunately. We've got various uh, more answers coming in here. Now, beans might not be grown in the UK. That's a very good point. And we will come on to transport. But it turns out, to many people's surprise, um, that actually um, the majority of things like, like these sort of beans, soybeans as well, would come by boat instead of by air. And when things come by boat, the greenhouse gas emissions are really negligible. And that's a massive shock. To, to many people because um, the, there's this, all this talk about food miles and uh, we're all told, you know, we should buy local, buy in season, but actually things that come by boat aren't contributing significantly to climate change compared to the production, for example. You know, it can be about the same as the production or smaller, but it's still way, 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 100, 100 times smaller um, it, it, climate impact to bring something by boat compared to bringing the same thing by air. So if we bring things by air, then it puts them into a similar category as lower impact meats in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. If they don't come by air, they come by boat, they're really not a big deal. And I don't want to spoil it for you, but there is a fantastic book by Mike Berners-Lee uh, called How Bad Are Bananas? And uh, close your ears now if you don't want to hear the answer, but the answer is not that bad. And there's a lot of fantastic stuff in that book, of course, other than that nugget of information, but that's really why they called it. Uh, that title was really to emphasize that point. And then also we've got this question about the packaging. And I'm afraid that this is another kind of massive misconception about the impacts of food on climate change. So there are many, um, many issues with packaging, but in terms of climate change, they're generally um, not the biggest issue. Um, if we take the example of say, um, some milk in a plastic carton. Even if we have a small plastic carton, which has got the, you know, the highest uh, ratio of plastic to, to milk that you can get, um, even in a one pint plastic carton, the plastic itself contributes less than one twentieth of the climate change of the milk inside the carton. So um, certainly for things like milk, animal products, then the packaging is much less significant than the contents of the packaging. And so if we think about the beans here, I have included the packaging in the calculation. Um, and in this calculation, it was in a can, but actually the results would be very, very similar um, if it was in plastic in terms of the climate impacts. And yes, there are other issues with plastic as well, but in terms of climate impacts, there's a very strong um, misconception um, when you survey members of the public and you say what are you doing about climate change and they pick from multiple options the one that comes out top is reducing plastic use and unfortunately that isn't going to solve climate change so there's, there's many good reasons for it but that is 
that is not unfortunately um, you know, going to solve the climate issues. Okay, so um, where were we? So yes, so you guys, maybe you've heard this before, I will read the book, uh, because you're really spot on, the, the closest anyone's really, you know, this is the uh, closest anyone's come really that in the talk I've given on this. So you're getting results which are sort of um, 10, 20, 30, 40 times, and that's about the range um, that we get depending on how that beef is produced. So for a typical European uh, uh, steak, then this is causing about 20 times the climate impact of the beans and the uh, potato dinner. And so you can see the, the um, breakdown there that the, this eight ounce steak is causing, um, you know, that's, that's over three times our daily budget before we've had anything else in that day. So on the other hand, if that steak could be produced in a more, um, in, a, in a better way, then we would still have uh, the methane being produced by the cow um, through the manure and the burps, but we might be able to get it maybe halving that, uh, depending on the production practice. But on the other hand, if that steak has come from across the other side of the world, um, where there's deforestation um, in order to, to produce the food for those, those cows, then this could be um, a factor of 100 uh, difference uh, rather than a factor of 20. So it does depend a bit on how this is produced, but it's still going to be significantly bigger than this daily budget. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, we should stop eating beef. But I would say, you know, first of all, look at quantities. Look, if you have a four ounce steak instead of an eight ounce steak, you've just halved the climate impacts of your of your dinner. Maybe share it with someone else. Um, uh, but, you know, first of all, start looking at quantities. It is my you know, starting point for this. But on the other hand, a lot of people are very shocked when they see these kind of numbers because the research shows people often get roughly the right ordering of foods, but they massively underestimate, unlike you guys on this call, they massively generally underestimate the size of the difference between different foods. Excellent. And this is actually great news because if all foods contributed about the same to climate change, that we'll be stuck because we have to eat. So the fact that we can have big differences between different sorts of food is, is really gives us some hope. Now then, I, I'm gonna try this one now. So um, feel free to, this is really to provoke your questions um, and to have a bit of a discussion. Um, so which do you think causes the most climate change? A bowl of cereal, a large latte, or two boiled eggs? So have a think about that and feel free to chip in with questions in the chat. Great. Don't be shy. There's no prizes for, no booby prizes for getting it wrong here. It's pretty unanimous though, I think. This is, uh, yeah. Any questions about that? Something to do with steaming the milk? Yeah, this is a great question, actually. And the coffee, uh, we've got to bring that coffee from overseas. Uh, we've got to do the processes and the processing and the packaging of that coffee as well. Lata's going to be very brave and uh, go with a new option there. Cereal, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be. Uh, it actually depends really on things that I haven't told you. So there's no right or wrong answer here because it depends a bit. On, on how much of each of these things you're having. Um, question for later, is there a calibration, a score list available to the public for different foods? Yes, absolutely. So um, yeah, we can, so, so these numbers are actually all in my book, um, which is freely available. Um, it, the, my book is actually free online, thanks to funding from the University of Manchester. So you don't need to go paying to get this information. Um, and so it's got all these numbers in there, actually, and all the details. And we've also got a nice calculator um, online, which I'll share with share a link with that with you on that at the end as well. Um, so, yeah, so the, it really depends on how much milk you have, basically. So for this cereal, I've assumed 200 grams, 200 mils of milk. And for the latte, I've gone to the websites of various um, coffee shops and seen that they would put typically 500 mils, that's a pint of milk into a large latte like that. So then inevitably, because there's more milk and milk is the biggest thing here, then we're gonna cause uh, more climate change from this latte with this amount of milk in it. 
And so it really does depend a lot on how much milk you have. Um, and then heating the milk surprisingly turned out to be much smaller than, than the contribution from, from producing the milk. Um, we're back to the cows and, and the, um, the methane again. And actually producing that coffee, um, processing that coffee, all of those transporting that coffee, all included in here. And you can hardly see it at the bottom uh, because it's a relatively small contribution to climate change, which is, which is often a surprise to people. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, well done, everybody. Um, and uh, we're going to do a, a sandwich one now. Uh, so we've got a chicken sandwich, a cheese sandwich, or a peanut butter and jam sandwich. Now, this is, this is quite a controversial one because a lot of people, um, you know, there's lots of different answers to this normally. So I'm very curious to see what a, what a, a well-informed audience we have here. <laughs> okay, I've got a couple of votes in so far. And again, feel free to, to add you know, comments and, and, and things that will lead to a discussion here um, about uh, what, what leads you to these, um, these guesses, which I understand you know, I'm putting you on the spot here. So thank you for joining in. Great. Getting a few different answers here. But the cheese might be winning at the moment. Could all change. Got peanut, a few peanuts coming in now. Oh, if it's British chicken, great question. Okay, yeah. So how does the country of origin affect the answer? We've got some more chickens coming in and another peanut. Excellent. Okay, right. Well, shall I reveal? Oh, peanuts might come by boat. Yes, well done, Helen. Yes, the peanuts are going to come by boat. Basically anything that um, is long life, um, that, will, will, that can go on a boat, will go on a boat. So um, something like obviously oranges, we know that oranges keep well on boats, that's, that's how they all avoided scurvy apparently, and apples also will come on a boat. But things like blueberries, um, things like green beans, um, things like asparagus, strawberries in the winter, raspberries in the winter, all of those things, they wouldn't keep for six weeks in your fridge. Um, and so they won't keep for six weeks in the hold of a boat. And so they have to come by air. <laughs> a great question in from Wendy, is the jam homemade and foraged? Brilliant question. Actually, I was at um, the Jodrell Bank Discovery Centre on Sunday and I noticed they have a fantastic range of foraged jams and pickles there. I don't know if anyone's come across this. I think it was Cheshire Foraging Company or something. And uh, they all sounded absolutely amazing. And I've been stocking up for Christmas on forage jam. But no, in this particular calculation, I was not aware of the, the option to, to do that uh, <laughs> commercially. And so I have assumed a, a typical jam uh, uh, that's sold in the shops. OK, right, well, we'll move on. <laughs> Anthony says cheese. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, um, yeah, so cheese comes out higher than chicken, which is a surprise to many people. Um, so you guys are pretty well informed here. Most people would go for the chicken um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, randomly selected audience. Um, and that's a surprise to a lot of people. But of course, as you may know, it takes about 10 kilograms of milk to produce one kilogram of cheese. Um, so we're really concentrating that down. And um, then the chicken, this really comes down to how we feed the chicken. So um, some people might have their own chickens. Um, I can see some people on this call I know have got chickens. And so it really depends on where that food is coming from. If it's coming from a nice bag of pellets that we, we scatter around, then those pellets probably contain soy and wheat, and that may come from a deforested region. And so on average, that tends to dominate the feed emissions um, coming from de deforested soy, and also that the feed tends to dominate the total emissions from chicken. So as to whether it's British or not, um, I'm not aware of there being a big difference in chicken feed in the UK um, compared to other countries. Although there have been some really exciting developments in the last few years with feeding chickens on insects that have been fed on food waste. Um, and that's a, there's a few British companies doing that now. Um, one's called EntoCycle. We had um, a very small company. We had um, a stand at the um, Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition in 2019. And we partnered with a few companies, including uh, a few very small companies, uh, including EntoCycle. And uh, we had a, a jar with some of these uh, black soldier fly larvae on our stand. And you could see the little larvae 
uh, you know, um, wiggling around in this jar and, and people would come and look at them and, and the kids loved that. Um, and they said, you know, just put, put any bits of rubbish in at the top and they'll eat that stuff. You know, we put some old um, digestive biscuits in, you know, we put, um, we put a, a, some bits of bana old banana in. And I can tell you by the end of the week, <laughs> it was pretty hot in that room and we regretted putting that banana in. I'm just going to say that much. So, uh, yeah, they do. They do chop their way through, uh, through anything. And that is also a great way to feed chickens, although, you know, the quantities of food waste that we're producing should be smaller and, um, you know, should not be so large that we could feed all of our chickens um, that we're currently eating through just um, insects from food waste. So it really comes down to what we feed the chicken. Now, the peanut butter, uh, many people are concerned again about the transport, but um, I forget who it was that said this now, but indeed those are coming. Yeah, Helen said that these are going to come by boat. And that is included in this calculation. And so you can see that, again, the transport is a much smaller issue than, than the contents of, of what we're actually eating. Great job. OK. And we could compare that. Um, I've just switched the order. Sorry. But um, we could compare that to a steak sandwich um, with, with um, that's 50 grams of steak in there. And we can see that we're already using up that budget. So um, this is just assuming sort of two regular slices of, of cheese or chicken or steak in this sandwich at 50 grams each. I have to confess that I put less peanut butter in this sandwich because I tried having a sandwich with 50 grams of peanut butter and it was it was a lot of peanut butter. So um, that, I think that's 20 grams in that calculation. So that, that's maybe not totally fair, but um, I've never seen anyone eat a 50 gram. Well, maybe my son, actually, maybe he maybe he did it once. <laughs> now I think about it, but we were all a bit worried about it. <laughs> um, anyway. Good. OK, so moving on, uh, we've got two, two more of these. So I'm going to I'm going to hopefully provoke Oh, the foraging. OK, sorry, the foraging. So as you can see, this is actually a regular um, industrially produced uh, jam and it's not a big deal. And of course, it'd be even lower than that if we'd foraged it, unless we'd uh, cooked that up in a big boiling pan for a very long time with the lid off, in which case the cooking emissions could have really wrapped up and actually been bigger than the commercial ones. So, um, so we can look at that in a bit later, if you, if you like. Excellent. OK, so now we've got a small bar of chocolate, uh, 25 grams, packet of crisps, a banana or an apple. Um, and if you're if you already uh, guessed the answer to that, how big do you think these are compared to this uh, daily uh, budget that we've got on the left hand, on the right hand side here? Going to pause for you to vote. and uh, chime in with any questions or observations here. Excellent. Great. It's always good to see a bit of controversy on these. Um, otherwise, I worry I've made it too easy. Excellent. Now, a lot of people get quite nervous at this point because, I mean, I, you know, I quite enjoy all of these foods. I do absolutely love crisps, so I was quite worried about this. And um, we've got uh, got comments about the um, manufacturing and um, some concern there about the chocolate bar um, because we don't want to get bad news. Um, right now, oh, this is a great point from Beverly actually about the nutritional value. So in all of these, I'm just showing you the greenhouse gas emissions, but we're not talking about the benefits. And we talked about milk, for example, earlier on, and some people will ask about soy milk. And of course, you know, dairy milk has a lot more nutrition in it than the same amount of soy milk, even though it will cause at least twice the climate impact. So there's definitely um, a lot of issues here to consider. But I, I, think, I think possibly for this audience, and certainly generally for the UK, we're already doing pretty well for nutrition generally. Um, and so, you know, often it will be more about just whether we really need that food or not. So that's one justification for ignoring it for a moment. Indeed, we don't necessarily need the energy that's in the chocolate bar. That's, that's definitely true. The, apple, the bananas are not going to be flown in, um, so they're going to come by boat. And I think we've got a fairly clear uh, winner for the chocolate, but with a few crisps uh, thrown in there and maybe one or two bananas. No one's gone for the apple. Um, so just to show you the answers here, they're all very small is, is the main takeaway from this. So you can hardly see any of them, basically, uh, compared to our daily budget. But the chocolate bar is just a little bit higher. But still, 
you know, you'd have to eat quite a, a worrying amount of chocolate uh, for this to be a really significant contribution to your daily um, greenhouse gas emissions in this, in this budget. Um, and in fact, we've got more than 25 grams of milk in a 25 gram bar of chocolate because we put powdered milk into chocolate and that's uh, concentrated down by a factor of 10 um, in order to, to get the, the powder. Uh, fun fact. Um, <laughs> Lars is happy about that. Excellent. And with the banana, the transportation there, you can hardly see a little purple bar there, but that is the climate impact of transporting those bananas by boat. Uh, basically, you can get a lot of bananas onto a boat and we need to share the impact out across all those bananas. And so it's actually smaller than the environmental impact, the climate impact of producing the bananas in the first place. Great. OK, last one now. Uh, which do you think causes the most climate change? Spaghetti bolognese, chicken curry and rice or fish and chips? And, and if bonus question here, how do you think those are going to compare to our daily budget um, that we have there? Great. Nice comments on your showing your working there. Thanks, Pippa. <laughs> I've just got a direct message from somebody saying they would like to eat a worrying amount of chocolate. <laughs> um, we've got some for the curry and rice there, some for the spaghetti bolognese. Okay, great. Excellent. I'm going to reveal uh, the answers now, I think. So um, this is for, again, a typical European production uh, system. I've got a comment about rice there from Beverly, so very well informed audience here, I'm realising. And so we can see that the main takeaway from this, oh, I've lost the, the grey bars disappeared, hasn't it? So these are all very comparable to our entire daily budget. And they're much bigger than the other things I've shown you on the previous slide. So the biggest takeaway from this um, is that for most people looking at dinner is going to be the most sort of um, uh, impactful way to start thinking about reducing climate impacts. Um, and yeah, the steak and the, the, sorry, the beef and the spaghetti bolognese is, is dominating that. Um, but actually, these are actually quite comparable, the chicken tea, masala and rice and the fish and chips. Um, and, uh, and indeed, some of that's coming from the rice, um, but some of that is also coming from the, 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 the cream in the sauce um, and the butter in that meal, as well as the chicken um, in, 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 in that as well. And so actually, if we had even you know, a smaller cod or, or shared a cod between two people, we could make a significant difference to that. Uh -huh, OK, where's the spaghetti coming from? Interesting. And in fact, well, this relates to really get back to um, farming methods here, because, um, yes, yeah, so this will come by by boat. Um, but on the other hand, it depends on the production practices. And so, yeah, we can we can produce um, spaghetti perfectly well in the UK um, and we can even produce it with fava beans and uh, and, and wheat in case you're um, Hodmerdod's uh, customer. Um, but uh, rice can actually be produced um, in paddy fields is mostly produced in paddy fields, which is bad, as was mentioned by Beverly. And that's because um, we've got rotting, um, we've got rotting uh, material at the bottom of that paddy field. So whenever you've got things decomposing without enough access to oxygen, then the chemists among you will be able to understand that that is going to go from carbon into methane, C CH4, rather than carbon dioxide, because there's not enough oxygen to produce the carbon dioxide. And per carbon atom, methane causes about 10 times the global warming of carbon dioxide. And so rice with lots of paddy fields with lots of water on is going to produce this methane. However, it is possible to grow rice um, in exactly the same way that we grow wheat. Um, so this is actually done in Italy, for example. And this is uh, you know, a significant uh, reduction in greenhouse gases from producing rice, but it's necessary to use more, more um, chemicals because the main benefit of the paddy fields is to get rid of pests. So mice don't swim under the water to eat the, the rice grains and also to reduce the amount of competition from weeds because rice is gonna survive underwater, but the other 
uh, competing plants are not. So this is, you know, uh, swings and roundabouts. Homemade versus takeaway, great question. So we could talk about cooking emissions um, and talk about how economies of scale are going to help reduce things if we get a takeaway. But at the same time, when we get a takeaway, we might have a much bigger portion and have more waste. So it depends a little bit on how you're going to cook that at home um, as well. But uh, most, of the, most of the greenhouse gas emissions for most things people eat are coming from the production of the food rather than from, from the later stages of the supply chain, from, from the processing, packaging um, and cooking. These are all generally smaller than, than the choice of which foods to eat for animal products. Excellent. OK. And just to illustrate how we might change that, if we were to switch from beef to chicken, we could bring that down by a factor of more than three. Or if we were to switch out um, chicken um, for a tin of lentils, even if we have tins of lentils rather than cooking them ourselves, it's still much lower. And that's something that I really didn't um, expect when I started this. I was like, oh, gosh, I'm opening a tin, but I can see the packaging. And, you know, maybe it's better to have chicken. But no, if you're having uh, things in tins, the, the, the packaging is, is way smaller than you know, having an animal product generally. So, um, you know, if it makes it easier just to make a transition there by going uh, straight to tins, then, then just go with it. Uh, we've got a question here. Uh, spaghetti bolognese with corn. Yes. So that would be quite similar. And I can show a slide actually, um, which, which compares these different uh, foods, because I think that, that would relate to one of the questions uh, that you guys asked about uh, getting the numbers. So I'm just struggling with this new version of PowerPoint, which doesn't look the same as my old version of PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip to a slide which would illustrate that corn question. Um, here we go. Okay, I will make that more visible, hold on. There we go. So yes, yeah, so we can look at the greenhouse gas emissions for a range of different uh, common protein sources. And now we're looking at the greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the amount of protein in a, in a typical uh, chicken breast. So they're all for the same amount of protein basically. And so you can see beef and lamb up here, uh, much bigger than, than the other things, but then cheese and milk come in next with, with ham. And then we've got things like eggs and fish and chicken and canned beans um, in this particular example do look pretty bad, but actually it depends how much you have, right? So this is per gram of protein. We're all eating generally more protein than we really need. So this is, this, this is slightly higher per gram of protein. Um, and then we've got corn right down here. So it actually depends on how you produce that corn. And so if you have corn slices, they tend to have other ingredients like egg in them, and they're also refrigerated, so there's more waste. And so that contributes to that number. Whereas if you have frozen corn pieces, um, then they have a higher fraction of mycoprotein, and also there's less waste because it's, it's frozen. So even though you've got that extra processing of freezing and cooking, it's still, um, even including that, then this will be a lower number. Um, and then it depends how you cook your beans as to how this, this comes out on this scale here. This is for, um, for, for um, pressure cooking them in my um, electric pressure cooker. Okay, great questions. Okay, what's the plan with timing, by the way? Because I, uh, I can wrap this up at any point. So uh, give me some steer on how long we're, I can go on we're, for we're literally all night. For you. We're comfortable for you to carry on, Sarah, if you can keep going. Um, yeah, another yeah, another yeah, few need... minutes, then we'll see if there's more, more questions yeah. come out of. Can I, whilst I've just got the microphone for a second, yeah. can I ask about pressure cooking? Oh, um, yes. I, I mean, ours got disposed of years ago, but are, are we saving a great deal of emission by keeping the steam in? Right. Excellent question. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yes. So if you think about something like cooking, then there's two factors, really. So one is what's the how much energy is that appliance using? And the other is how long is the appliance on for? And so, if you know, generally speaking, they're fairly similar. An oven will be about three kilowatts. Um, so an oven is quite using quite a lot of power, I should say, as a physicist. Um, is using quite a lot of um, energy per unit time. 
Um, whereas a microwave is more like uh, one kilowatt. So there's a factor of three difference, but you know, roughly speaking, it's much more about the amount of time things are on for generally. And so if you have a pressure cooker, then you're cooking for a lot less time. And also you're not evaporating off loads of steam into the kitchen and filling the kitchen with steam if you were boiling something up on the hob. So in that sense, you know, as a rough rule of thumb, if you're cooking it for less time, then it will use less um, energy. An exception to that would be a slow cooker, um, which if it's very well insulated, then that's going to be great because I can see you're smiling there, Stuart. Have you got a pressure? Have you got a slow cooker there? Yeah, you know, just my wife already beat me, beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So that is, a, is an exception because if you've got good insulation, and they do vary a lot, actually. I found um, I did a few experiments at home with a couple of pressure uh, slow cookers I have. Then um, you can you, you can you know you can get these things to put on the wall, can't you? Which measure the power and measure the energy that you've used um, in that socket. So you know you'll have to experiment at home with your devices that plug into the wall. But generally speaking, an oven is the worst. Um, we did we published paper on this actually in Nature Food about surveying different um, cooking practices um, according to how long people cook for, different things for, and, and which appliances they use. And that the cooker is, is the worst on, on all of these uh, metrics, basically, because if you think about it, you're heating up a huge metal box as well as the food. Um, so, you know, you have to put it on maybe 15 minutes before, then you need to leave it on while the food heats up. And then you've got this big hot metal box, which is going to heat the room up. So if you needed the room heating up anyway, and you've switched off all of your you know, fan heaters and, and, and central heating, um, because you know your, your cooker is going to heat the room up, then that's fine um, because you're just displacing one thing with another thing. On the other hand, you know, if you're then having to open the windows because it's, it's too hot in the kitchen, then you know, there's maybe, maybe something that could be reduced there. Um, so yes, great question. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to just share a few resources uh, before I wrap up, um, and then you can go away and, and play with these to your heart's content. Um, this, the, this next slide, I'm just going to say I, I was particularly gutted and disappointed when I saw this because I absolutely love lamb curry, and so this was a great disappointment to me, um, but you can see a few different options there for a curry and, uh, and the differences between the climate impacts there. And if you want to spend a very long time looking at all these different numbers and playing with different ways of cooking beans and, and all these things, then you can find all these in this free version of my book, which is um, available thanks to funding from the University of Manchester. I have put an Amazon link there, but that's to the free book. So, you know, uh, if, you, if you get it free, then uh, does that count as taking money away from Amazon? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, now the best questions of all are, you know, there's not just one number, is there? Um, so when I started this, I was saying, you know, what's the number for beef? And everyone's looking at me, you know, from the research field, like horrified that I could be suggesting there's a single number. Um, but actually, um, you know, there's a big range. And so I'd love to see labels on uh, packaging, uh, which we can talk about if you're interested. But actually, this was done um, about uh, it was 2007. Walker's Crisps put labels on their packets saying, that this bag of crisps caused 75 grams of carbon dioxide to go up into the atmosphere. Now, if I had noticed that in 2007, I would have had no clue whether that was a big number or a small number. And so, you know, and that's basically what happened. I've talked to some of the people who were involved in that, that it gave them no market advantage and they stopped doing it. And, you know, now we're starting to see um, a rise in people doing this. So Quorn have put lots of numbers on their website. Um, you might have noticed these numbers on the Oatly packets. Um, Flora Butter have started doing it, but with a slightly different unit here. Um, and even in Denmark, they've actually said they're going to be putting labels onto foods in the next five years. So there's a real uh, potential resurgence of this. But on the other hand, you know, it, it really takes a lot to get people behind this. And I just want to advertise this fabulous uh, app if you haven't already seen it which you can barcode scan uh, different foods. And then they've they actually, um, James Hand there has added on greenhouse gas emissions, high, medium, low, or very high to, the, to those. Um, although you can probably guess those from, from some of the information we've talked about. Um, so I'm just gonna share a couple of links to uh, Climate Food Challenge is a game that we developed um, in order to um, get people involved in this topic. 
So if you go to our website, takeabitecc.org, then you can get your friends and family playing this. It is a bit addictive, I have to say, um, but hopefully asking questions about these things as well. And also these climate food flashcards, which again, there's 72 of them. Um, you can download them and spend a long time on the guillotine. Um, or uh, we are wondering whether we should actually start um, selling them and, and start a company, but uh, be grateful for any advice on that. Um, it's linked all the way to all the original literature on the website. We're working with various different countries um, at the moment, producing new versions of these cards for use, for example, here in Telugu. Um, and we've also created this uh, calculator on our website where you can type in different foods from the book um, and then you can even edit the quantities um, and see the breakdown of all the different contributions there and, and change it to your heart's content, depending on your own personal uh, choices. And we also created a whole load of free videos for schools over lockdown. Um, and we've got worksheets where you've got kids calculating the greenhouse gas emissions from driving compared to um, having a shower, depending on how long they spend in the shower. That's something that has been a topic of conversation at home, certainly. Um, anyone with uh, kids <laughs> spending forever in the shower. Um, and uh, looking at transport, um, kids calculating the amount of emissions from transporting a certain distance compared to bringing the same food by truck, for example. And also using these flashcards to choose different dinner options and add up the greenhouse gas emissions and see, see how that adds up. And also looking at more options from these flashcards. So you can download any of these uh, free uh, tools from our website. We're a bunch of academics um, trying to share information, a scientific consensus on how different foods contribute to climate change. Um, and just to consider that alongside all the other factors um, that we make decisions about with food. Brilliant. So I'm going to stop uh, with the slides there. And I'm just seeing an interesting question from Pauline. So um, how low have you managed to get your family carbon footprint, if you don't mind me asking? And how easy is it to calculate our own? It would seem very fiddly to do. Yes, yeah, so I definitely looked into this a fair bit. Um, so uh, <laughs> over lockdown, we were on a pretty, um, pretty strict regime because I didn't have time to think about too many other things. Uh, so we had, a, had a quite a, a short rotation menu of uh, less than a week, probably, um, involving a lot of chickpeas and lentils. Lentil salad is a big uh, favourite in our family, actually. Um, and also we were doing a sort of roasted chickpea thing. Uh, using Hodmodod's uh, UK grown chickpeas, although I noticed they've stopped doing those now. So um, you can also do it with um, yellow peas, which actually grew in our garden this summer. So um, not very many, but uh, it is possible. Um, I think, you know, it's basically hard to get it below two kilograms, um, you know, just trying to do the calculations there. Uh, I mean, you know, having something like oats for breakfast, for example, um, you know, but once you get into more interesting questions like chia seeds, for example, very important, um, for omega-3s, um, if you're a vegan, for example. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there are no calculations in the academic literature for chia seeds. Um, so once you start getting off the mainstream foods, then it becomes harder to really estimate um, the values. So I think it, it is pretty fiddly to do. You can do a little bit of it from that calculator. But on the other hand, probably you're going to start asking about foods that aren't in there. And then it kind of needs some expert input to sort of make a, a guess as to what it might be based on existing foods in that in that. So um, we've just been doing a project actually with the BBC World Service um, for, a, for a web article looking at the impacts of different foods and food diaries. And it, it, it was quite a bit, quite a substantial bit of work in the end, actually, um, to do all of those calculations. So it'd be great to see uh, more availability for people to do that. I'd be interested in trying to figure out how to do that. Um, Good, good question there. Thank you, Pauline. Any other questions? Uh, you can type them in or, or do you want to do, do a hands up thing? No one putting their head over the parapet, so. That's all right. That's all right. Oh. Ah, have you thought of a good question, Fiona? Have you thought of taking the flashcards to schools? Yeah. So we have done a little bit in schools. So um, in the week before COP, we actually did a. Um, pre-COP schools climate um, food summit involving various um, schools. So it's about uh, four schools across the UK. Turns out schools have been a bit busy lately. So we didn't get as many uh, schools involved as we'd hoped to get involved, but um, we did, we, we wanted to keep it um, relatively manageable to sort of pilot doing this kind of thing. 
And so we did uh, four sessions in each school, um, uh, most of them online, but one of them actually involved going and cooking a burrito with them um, and uh, sort of choosing the ingredients for that and calculating the total emissions and also challenging them to come up with a menu for, for COP, uh, which it seems was not actually used um, <laughs> in the real thing. But uh, this was really good fun and we got a lot of great feedback and the, the, the kids came up with, they had to come up with an idea for what they were going to do um, in their school on this topic. And we had one school where the kids were actually estimating um, sort of traffic lights for the, the foods in their school menus and putting those on the school menus. So that was a really fun one. Uh, another school did a song, uh, which is quite catchy. And another one made a board game, uh, sort of educational board game. So there were some really um, innovative ideas coming out of that, which was brilliant fun. Um, and we're applying for grants to do, that, do this kind of thing um, uh, more um, broadly, but um, it would take quite a bit of resource. Um, so if anyone's got any ideas how to do that, that would be brilliant. Is there a case for compulsion when it comes to, mm -hmm. to getting people to alter their diet? Okay, it's a great question. Thanks, Helen. So I think that um, what the research on obesity shows is that giving people more information does not change behaviour. So um, I got a lot of pushback at first when I when I was um, you know talking about all of this um, to food experts because they sort of said, well, you know, we already have the research on obesity which shows that more information is not going to solve it, and actually that we're actually potentially putting a lot of burden onto people by providing individuals with this information about how to change individual behaviour. So I take those points, but I also anecdotally feel like there's a lot of people, probably most of you, already doing a lot of things and putting quite a lot of energy and thought into what to eat, but with not necessarily as much information as you would like. And so I feel like there is there is a, you know, not necessarily a, 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 a majority, but a small minority or maybe a large minority of people who are already really putting a lot of time and energy into choosing foods who don't have the information. So that's partly why I think climate labelling is important. But also, actually, when you look at um, supermarket behaviour, and this has now been, been clear in the last year or two, that actually a small minority or even a large minority of people can drive decision making in supermarkets because they want people to switch supermarkets. So even if the majority of people are eating, you know, um, omnivore diet, regular omnivore diets, a rise in flexitarian and veganism has led supermarkets to produce their own uh, plant ranges or, you know, whatever it's called in the different supermarkets. You can see it on the shelves already in the last year or two. So actually, even a, even a minority of people can drive systems change, which makes it easier for everybody. And my other counter to that comment is that actually the research on obesity does show that in more and more information changes people's receptiveness to changes in policy. So if people didn't understand that um, sugar is closely linked with obesity and that obesity is a major health problem um, in terms of type 2 diabetes, then there wouldn't be acceptance, um, as much acceptance of a sugar tax. So at the moment, we're in a situation where we do not have um, climate related taxes on food, for example. Um, and in fact, in the national food, the UK national food strategy that came out uh, a month ago, they specifically mentioned that they did not consider a meat tax because they um, had found that it was socially unacceptable to suggest that. And we saw even uh, two weeks ago, I think it was a report that went up onto the government's website about behaviour or change that was quickly withdrawn, as some of you may have seen, and also, um, you know, almost denied by ministers saying that uh, they were not going to tell people what to eat. So we have a major culture problem at the moment that people, it, you know, it, it's kind of politically toxic to um, talk about climate related food policies. And that's what I want to see change. And if we think about five years ago with plastics, um, you know, we think what's happened in terms of public opinion on plastics in the last five years, we see supermarkets, politicians falling over themselves to tout their amazing new policies on reducing plastics. 
could we see in the next five years the same thing happen with climate friendly food policies? That's what I want to see. I see lots of questions that come in in the meantime. Great. OK, uh, so yes. Oh, yes. So the point of that was to say that um, we need systems change, not just a minority of people changing what they eat. Um, but in order to drive that change, then we need to have people having information across the board and us all to be sharing this kind of information. Baking cakes uses so much oven energy. Can we still bake cakes? Um, great question, Pauline. So if you're baking one cake in the oven, um, then yes, relatively speaking, it's going to be quite a lot of energy. You're probably going to have quite a few slices out of that. So it's a lot better than maybe putting one jacket potato in the oven for two hours already, isn't it? So um, you're, you're, you know, you're not going to be up there with that. But also you could potentially bake multiple cakes at once, of course, um, and maybe freeze them or share them with your friends and take it in turns. So there are ways around that. And uh, certainly we can still eat cakes. I think uh, I'm certainly hoping that's the case. Um, Flora do plant butter, uh, which contains sustainable palm oil. OK. <laughs> Yes, so thanks, Helen. Palm oil. Um, so it turns out that um, palm oil is a very, very efficient um, and, uh, way of producing oil. So the yield of um, uh, date palm is, is very high in terms of um, amount of oil per unit area of land and much, much better than you know, alternatives by a factor of two or three. However, the massively increasing demand for oil which is absolutely um you know increasing year on year almost exponentially um it's driving deforestation and there is no you know the controls on that are not good and there is a question about how well even the sustainable palm oil is being controlled so i think that it's it's unfortunate that we you know in principle it's a great way of getting oil but in practice at the moment uh, is not sorted out. So in terms of climate impact, it's not a big deal, but there are other many biodiversity issues there. Okay, wow. How, yes, go on, <laughs> Stuart. Uh, I think you're doing really, really well. You've been talking for a fantastic length of time and fielding all these wonderful questions. Would you like to just check, choose one sort of of the remaining right. questions as a closing right. question? How am I gonna get through all this? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, but Ooh, local vegetables. Uh, are there plans to standardise labelling? Um, so there's a lot of talk about this at the moment. I'm very optimistic this is going to happen, but we don't um, we don't know for sure. Um, I'm, Fiona's got a hand up as well. There, do we have? Should we take a live one? Fiona, do you want to unmute? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Please. Um, I was really interested in the idea of calculating your diet according to your carbon emissions. I have heard of the wiki or the wiki act, but I hadn't really made the connection with how you, would, you ought to set a target. You know, um, there's several of us on this call from um, Cheshire Federation of WIs, and obviously the WI is a massive organisation with a lot of people who are meeting every month. It seems to me like, and we all, always think about food and we always make cake, you know, but we haven't necessarily thought about how we, the ingredients we put into our diet. I just think you've got a captive audience there that you could almost use as your guinea pigs, really. I think there's a real opportunity. And the wow. other day was um, World, the Scout Organization have a World Challenge badge, you know, and one of it is climate change. One of the aspects is climate change. And I did a load with my scouts last week on climate change to the COP20. Six, but again, I didn't know about those flashcards. I'd love to have had scouts working on those flashcards, working out what they ate in that day and how much, you know, um, how many carbon emissions they'd use. So there are target groups of people who could be reached quite quickly with that sort of thing. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, let's have a chat about that. Because I think that, um, yeah, we could, we could look into where we can get funding to sort of do some of that work that would, would you know, support that. Because I think that's the bit that I can't get my head around at the moment, because obviously I'm supposed to be writing papers and I've just started working one day a week at DEFRA as well. So it's going to be tricky to, to do everything, but there's a team of people who could, could help with this. If we can, if we can figure out how to, how to support them to do it. So I think that would be amazing. 
Um, and maybe there's a way that we can work together or that you guys could use the numbers even. I mean, I, the, the numbers are all there and I'm more than happy to, to help, you know, make sure it's in a good format for you guys to use. So that'd be really interesting to talk, um, talk to you with. Yeah, there's a group, I mean, there's some climate ambassadors on here tonight from Cheshire, but there are climate ambassadors for WIs throughout the country. So there is a, there is a group of people already who are sort of looking at this with a wide brief about trees and transport and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, food is a big part of it. I hadn't realised how big a part it was until tonight. It's been a really good talk. I oh, thank you very much. Midnight and looking at all your slides, because there's so much detail in the final. Yeah, one. I'm happy to share, share a link to the slides, by the way. Yeah. No, I think that, um, you know, the, the numbers are there, basically. and We're keen for people to use them. And if there's specific, you know, numbers that you want that aren't there, then, then you know we can we can certainly easily look those up. I guess in my dreams there'd be a fantastic kind of web tool that everyone could enter all their foods into um, and do it, all the calculations automatically for everybody. And, and in my dreams that would exist. But actually, you know, if, if you guys are happy to, you know, um, delve into getting the numbers and, and multiplying them by the, the quantities and so on yourselves and adding them all up, then you could get you could put you know greenhouse gas emissions estimates on lots of different recipes, for example. Um, that would be a really interesting um, output that, you know, I'd love to see recipe books with all these numbers in, um, you know, available so that you could compare, you know, maybe a challenge of seeing how many recipes, or how many dinners you can make that are less than one kilogram of emissions. Um, but, you know, maybe ticking certain protein boxes or whatever, that would be an amazing resource, I think. Well, I think that is a fantastic note. Fiona, thank you for that. And I think the link uh, between this evening's talk and the WI and baking cakes I think is one I shall savour for the evening. Now, I'm, I'm rather hoping that um, Amanda Stevens is uh, 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 still online. Are you there, Amanda? Can you unmute yourself? Hello. Amanda, hello there. If you just stand by for a moment, Amanda. When Amanda's finished, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to all unmute yourselves and we'll finish the evening in a traditional way. Amanda, would you like to say a few concluding words of thanks to Sarah? Yeah, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to do this. I'd like to start by saying there's maybe 60 of us listening to your talk this evening. And uh, if we're not careful, you, you could drive us all into a, a pit of despair because we're never going to get out of bed in the morning because we're worried about calculating the CO2 effect of our shower, our drive to work, what we eat. But I, I jest, I think what you've done is given us food for thought. Um, I have a copy of your book and we have read it and I'd like to explain how it affects our life and how it probably affects the life of the other people on the screen here. But first of all, it certainly gives us food for thought whenever we're preparing a meal about what we eat, how much of it we eat and how we cook it. So things are moving there and I'm sure that's true of other people here. Um, we had the, the book out, I suppose we were showing off really, when we had people around to dinner and it led to a conversation about the impact of food on the climate. And um, I think that's a good way of getting other people to think about this. Unfortunately, all the people we know have already thought about these things. It's the people who haven't thought about them who never come to dinner at our house. And then, <laughs> <laughs> is that a deliberate policy or <laughs> no. well, the final point which i'm really thankful that fiona noticed was there are, fiona are you a member of the wi definitely yeah, yeah. yeah. so that makes is at least nine members of the wi here this evening i think we're making a takeover bid for the world but i think you should talk to the WI because they, uh, the climate ambassadors here would be very interested and with, as Fiona said, the link with baking and food um, is a very important one. You have given us all a lot of food for thought. I am not going to calculate the impact of every meal I serve, but I am going to think about it as I buy my shopping or uh, I prepare the food. So thank you very much for giving us all that information. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, do unmute yourselves and say thank you to Sarah once again in our traditional English way. <laughs> wow.
Gosh, first time I've heard applause for a long time. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> thank you. On that note, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, keep your eye on the emails. Watch out for um, Festival of Nature 2022. The planning's already begun. Sorry. And yeah, stay safe. See you. And thank you again for coming this evening. Good night, everyone. Good Bye night. for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at the check is there actually.